Down there resides the sum of all necromantic transgression, she said in the sing-song way of a child repeating a poem. The unperceivable howl of ten thousand million unfed ghosts who will hear each echoed footstep as defilement. They would not even be satisfied if they tore you apart. The space beyond that door is profoundly haunted in ways I cannot say, and by means you won't understand. And you may die by violence, or you may simply lose your soul. Gideon rolled her eyes so hard that she felt in danger of twisting the optic nerve. I knew five things about this book before I started reading it. One, my wife's friend from college said, this is the best book I've ever read, you have to read it. Two, my wife started reading it, couldn't get into it, never finished it. Three, one of my friends from college said, I couldn't really get into it, I didn't, st I didn't finish it. Four, that person's spouse said, oh my god, it's amazing, you have to read this book. And tiebreaker, the premise in five words or less is, Lesbian Necromancers in Space! So with that tiebreaker, I obviously had to read this book. And now that I have, I understand where everyone is coming from. Gideon the Ninth is awesome, just not the opening. The first three chapters are a narrative train wreck. I fear that Gideon the Ninth and Nofet Gloss both attended the same school of writing, where the teacher walks into the classroom on day one wearing a garish outfit and smelling of pepperoni and sulfur, slaps the first student they come across in the front row, and declares that all stories must grab the reader's attention at all costs. And worse, this terrible writing teacher then instructs the students on how their opening has to obey every single writing rule simultaneously. You must introduce the protagonist. You have to give them a problem, which is different from their goal. You have to make the protagonist unique and a little spicy. Maybe, you know, they look at porn, I don't know. Be mysterious, but don't forget to include world building and shove backstory down your reader's throat as hard and fast as possible. Also include an action scene. That should be like your top priority. All of these things are your top priority. And my writing advice is, maybe you should start your story a little earlier or later. Just because I have questions doesn't mean I'm intrigued. Just because there's a lot to keep track of doesn't mean I'm engaged. And in the meantime, I have no emotional attachment to this main character. In fact, I dislike her. You don't get my attention just for writing a character with attitude. And I cannot stress this enough, attitude is not a personality. If you want an antidote to this sort of science fiction, something that starts small and builds outward, always keeping close to the truth of the characters and the truth of their perspectives and backgrounds, then may I recommend my novel, Crew of Exiles. Writers, chill out about your openings. Focus on the characters, their relatability, their struggles. Everything else can wait. Reading Gideon the Ninth or No Fet Gloss, I can't help but get a sense of desperation from the authors, like they are terrified of losing their reader's attention for even just one little moment. I blame the publisher or the editor or someone. It's like the author was forced to attend these meetings. I need ideas, people. I need something shocking! We already did the nuke, uh, the airport massacre, we blew up a kid. We can't really shock anyone anymore, can we? They're gonna see it coming. Simple idiots. Fade in. You're a secret service agent. You find a black box in a terrorist stronghold. What's in it? A bomb? Wrong! Box of puppies. Oh, that is pretty surprising, I guess. You know, that's a really good point that I think that- <laughs> What the- Yeah, I just threw a baby at you! Why'd you have a baby in your coat? Is that shocking? A little, I guess. But why? Because shocking. By the end of chapter three, all the reader has seen is a sloppy revolving door of character introductions, a dramatic fight scene, and a long, boring church service slash political event in which the perspective character literally does nothing other than provide occasional color commentary. And honestly, the church service was the best part. It was packed with vivid descriptions and interesting world building, and it wasn't like drinking from a fire hose. If I get published someday, and the publisher says, Neil, baby, we love your book. It's great. We just need you to pump up that opening. You know, something a little bit more like Gideon the Ninth or No Fat Gloss. I'm going to say, F off. You're terrible at your job and you're making books worse. I'm just kidding. Please publish me. I would give my firstborn to be published. Here you go. You would take my dog away from me? I was just kidding. I would never give you my dog just to be published. 
My wife, maybe. That was just a joke. We're going to keep that between you and me. It's fine. My wife will never find out. She doesn't watch my videos anyway. Where was I? The opening. The opening is absolute dog shit. That refers to other dogs, baby. Not your dog shit. You shit gold. That's why I always pick it up and bring it back to the house. Kidding about that too, of course. I throw it away. It's dog shit. But we're gonna keep that between you and me. My dog doesn't need to know. And she doesn't watch my videos either. <laughs> I just want somebody to watch my videos and to like and subscribe and ring the bell and also buy my book. Link in the description. <laughs> After the initial rough start, I was won over by Gideon the Ninth. The story, let's say, stabilizes into something interesting moderately well paced, and it's fun. I mean, after a short time in, we get to see undead skeletal servants unloading space shuttles on the surface of, I think, a tropical planet Mercury? Bravo. Now, admittedly, that's still just spectacle. Much more importantly, the relationships between the characters begin to develop a lot more. Gideon comes into her own as a delightful protagonist, mixing the best parts of Vi and Jinx from Arcane. She has Vi's eagerness to get into fights and block punches with her face, and she has Jinx's fun, chaotic energy. And none of either character's depressing tragedy. Or at least Gideon isn't so angsty about her tragedy. Add to that the fact that Gideon has, at most, three overworked and precious little brain cells, and you have a character who is just a blast to ride along with on this story. Here's a weird comparison for you. Gideon the Ninth reminded me of Big Trouble in Little China, partly because they both make some quirky presentation decisions that feel super fresh, but also because the main character is tough, dumb, and not the most interesting or capable person in any particular room at any particular time, and I love that choice for a main character. Big Trouble was waiting for Jack Burton. Who? Jack Burton. Me. How are you gonna spring us? I have no idea. Also, this is how I picture Gideon the Ninth, and no one can tell me that that's not what she looks like. Kurt Russell really be rocking a great butch lesbian aesthetic in that movie. On that note, calm down about the lesbian aspect, boys and girls. The PG-13, or perhaps even R rating in Gideon the Ninth, comes 99.9% .9 from violence and only a fraction of a percent from mild horniness throughout. One last note, then I'm going to wrap up. There are more than 18 characters to keep track of in this book. Two come from each of the nine planets. I guess Pluto is included. I actually don't really know for certain if this is Earth's solar system. That was just my default assumption. But in any case, there's a ton of characters. The author does a masterful job reminding the reader who's who, and you mostly only need to know who two of the characters are. Murder also significantly reduces the headcount as the book progresses. But it's still a bit overwhelming, and reading this on a Kindle, which is what I did, I couldn't just stick my finger in the who's who reference section, which is thankfully provided. I just did my best and accepted some confusion, and I still loved this book, but you may not be up for a roster big enough to field opposing baseball teams. In conclusion, no book is flawless, and Gideon the Ninth is more flawed than most, but it is also more fun than most. It's full of heart, it's full of spunk. Get past chapter three before you start judging it too harshly, and writers, Push back on your editor, your publisher, whoever is telling you that your opening needs to juggle flaming knives on a unicycle. It doesn't. Harrowhark Nonagesimus swung open the door, haloed faintly in the electric lights from the tier, her acerbic little face as welcome as a knee to the groin. If you want to do something interesting, come with me, she commanded. If you want to wallow in your shockingly vast reserves of self-pity, cut your throat and save me the food bill. Oh damn, then can I join your old man and lady in the puppet show? How the world would suffer without your wit, said Harrowhark blandly. Get your robe, we're going down to the catacomb. Gideon's got that intense death's head makeup, but Shy would like to give you some subtler makeup tips. Obviously she was beautiful before, but you really get that nice paling effect from rolling in the dirt, and it brings out the dark around your eyes without need for eyeliner.